So in this module, I'll give you a concrete example of how machine learning works in the context of, of a real brain-computer interface design. So I'll give you a, an example um, problem, a, a learning problem or calibration problem. So we have a task that um, the person is supposed to do. So say we record some data um, in which we are presenting a person with a series of pictures. So the person is, has EEG recorded, and we present one picture every two seconds. And half of these pictures um, are exciting, and half of them are not. So this is how we set them up. And we are recording one channel uh, of EEG up here um, at the CZ location. And so now the question is, how can we design a brain-computer interface um, that can determine for a given moment whether the person uh, is being shown an exciting or a non-exciting image. And you would answer that question based on a chunk of EEG around the time when the person sees that image. And what we will do now uh, is, uh, well, we are taking each of these 300 trials, we cut out a chunk of EEG around that of about a second, and we are now extracting a, a short feature vector uh, that characterizes the EEG in a compact manner. And we're assigning a label, uh, either E for excited or any for non-excited. And then we're using machine learning uh, to find some kind of a um, statistical mapping from, the, from a feature vector onto the output, and uh, onto the label, basically. And so the first question is, how, what kinds of features could we use to, um, to characterize EEG uh, in a compact manner? Uh, here is a simple example. So if you have one channel of EEG, and you, you might think there's perhaps a peak when the person sees the image. And you could characterize a peak, say, this is pretty ad hoc, by its width um, and its latency and time. This is the second parameter. And the third parameter would be the height or the amplitude of the peak. And so you've taken a whole series of EEG values, and you've reduced it to three numbers. Uh, each trial, each moment where the person sees an image, um, now has these three numbers associated, and of course the original label. And now we could plot these um, these feature vectors, which are 3D, um, in some kind of a space. And let's say we're plotting all the exciting tr trials that we had in red and all the non-exciting trials in green. Then we get two point clouds in this 3D space. So say for a given trial like this dot here, you have a parameter that's the width of the peak, another parameter that's the amplitude, and a third parameter, which is the latency. Uh, and this is where you draw, the, basically, place the dot in this 3D space here. And if you do that for all the exciting tries, you get this distribution. All the non-exciting, you get that distribution. So now that all is already reveals some interesting structure in here. And um, that is the kind of representation uh, that we call the feature space. It's, it's the space of features. Uh, it, normally, that space is much higher dimensional, not just three. It might be 10,000 or so, um, or in, in some cases. But here, it's rather simple for illustration purposes. And so now, the task is um, to design um, a statistical mapping from that on the output. But to get there, um, uh, let me just summarize the processing flow. So we have our EEG recording. We have multiple events happening that we happen to annotate. And around each of these, we cut out this chunk of EG. We remember the label, um, like 2, 1, 1. And then we're taking this collection of data extract features. Uh, here, we're doing this with the peak calculation algorithm. And that gives us the feature vectors and their associated labels from our training set, um, which we s call x and y, the matrix x and the vector y. And we send it through a training function which is a machine learning method. And that gives us a parameter description or parameter vector here. And that is part of the model. This is the model that we learn um, from that data. And that model it tells us how we have to treat a particular point to tell whether it's exciting or non-exciting. And so one, one simple algorithm is linear discriminant analysis is one of the simplest possible, where the idea is, um, you're finding a plane that lies in this space, which nicely separates the two point clouds so that you can tell um, if a point is on one side of the plane, uh, it's, say, class 1. And if it's on the other side of the plane, hyperplane, by the way, 
uh, it's class two. So this is a way to label points. The idea generally is um, that you get an, a new observation, say, um, now online, and that is something that you send through your feature extraction. It gives you the point in the space, but you don't yet know the label because you don't have a label. And that's the task of this LDA representation um, based on which you decide um, what class it is. And this hyperplane, by the way, um, is characterized by some parameters. And it's basically a vector that we call theta here, which um, encodes the orientation of the plane in the space. This has as many numbers in it as the space has dimensions. Um, and this is actually relatively easy to learn. It's fairly simple math. I'm not going to um, pester you too much with that here. But basically, what you need to do is um, you take all the uh, red points, and you take the average, which is the mean for that class mu i, and you do the same for the green. And you're also evaluating this, which gives you the covariance matrix, which characterizes, in a sense, the spread of this distribution. And you do, the, do it for the other as well. And the vector that's orthogonal to this plane is basically the mean difference, which is lying between these two curves here, uh, it's between these two blobs, and rescaling it in some way um, based on the spread of these distributions, uh, the inverse average covariance matrix. Uh, this is some kind of a rescaling in multiple dimensions, which um, gives you, at the end, this maximally discriminative hyperplane. And so this is this parameter. And the last free parameter is the shift of the plane relative to the origin in the coordinate system. That's this b here. And b is also very easy to calculate. It's basically just taking the midpoint between the distributions. And um, so this is average here. And then projecting it onto this vector. Uh, it's this little calculation here. So um, that is for the simple case of two classes. With multiple classes, there's other methods. And it's also under the assumption that there's equally many red and green dots here. Um, the, there's some balancing numbers in there if, if, um, if you have different prior probabilities for class 1 versus class 2. So once you've learned these parameters from some training data, that gives you parameters, theta and b, in some kind of a mapping, a statistical mapping, from feature space on to label. And it's basically a linear mapping like this. Uh, take the, f the um, uh, weight vector, inner product with a given trial that projects the trial onto the weight vector, and then add the bias, which um, you know, gives you a positive number if it's on one side of the plane, or negative number if it's on the other side. And for classification, what we actually want is we want minus 1 or plus 1 as output. And that's what the sine function does. It takes a sign of the output. That is actually a nonlinear mapping. Um, so there's a few caveats with this whole process. It's very simple, and it works very well. But uh, it assumes that the data in each class or under each condition is Gaussian distributed in some multivariate sense. And uh, this, of course, only works well to the extent that, um, that this assumption is fulfilled. And the other assumption is that the shape of the distribution, uh, the shape of the point cloud, is identical for all classes. If one point cloud is larger than the other, the actual optimal kind of hyperplane is not really a plane anymore, but it's a curve. So the, the benefit is that it's, it's very simple, very easy to implement, and in the limit of infin infinitely many samples, and if these assumptions are fulfilled, it's the optimal classifier. But the issue is that, again, it makes this Gaussian assumption. If you have one, if you have one outlier, that can break your, um, your result. And also, it can be very hard to estimate these covariance matrices, sigma 1 and sigma 2, if you have too few trials or too many dimensions. That's called the curse of dimensionality here. So now with that stuff in place, uh, the, the next um, step is to take all that and put it together into one complete BCI. And so what we will do is to train this, bring computer interface, we take our original calibration recording and we band pass filter it for to get rid of drifts and things like that. Then we extract the epochs, like I said, relative to the target markers, um, which are the picture presentations. And we extract features for each of these so-called epochs. And then we submit all the feature vectors to the LDA, get the parameters out. And that's what we stick 
into our final um, BCI uh, structure. Uh, so when we're using this online, what we'll do is we uh, implement, we take the signal, we apply the same bandpass filter online now. This is our filter graph. And then in a sliding window of the output, we do our feature extraction and we apply the predictive mapping here that we just described to the features. And that gives you either plus one or minus one, depending on whether the person saw an exciting or non-exciting picture. And you can view this as a very basic excitement detector. So this um, basically can be implemented online and, um, and would work if, if you're lucky, <laughs> if, if it is indeed easy enough to recognize this from one channel. So um, uh, to sum this up, there's a few coarser grained representations in, involved in, in the BCI field and also in the tools that we're going to use to calculate all that. And so you can view um, a, a, a BCI as being described by a BCI model, which says, this is the filter graph that I'm going to apply, and that's the filters, that's the parameters for this filter, and then the prediction function, and that's um, the function of form as well as the parameters of the prediction function. And all the numbers are basically the, the result of the various calibration stages, and the overall structure is somehow prescribed based on your overall computational approach. And that's, in fact, the representation that's being um, calculated and produced by BCI Lab, the toolbox. This is exactly what a BCI model is in this toolbox. And that's going to be relevant later. And also, um, you can say there's a, there's a particular um, template to how, um, how we just described this particular process, and that is um, something that we're calling BCI paradigms in this toolbox. Uh, y you can say a BCI paradigm is, um, uh, is the full description and codification of a particular type of calibration and prediction process in the BCI. So you have a calibrate function that says everything that I just explained, including signal processing. And that produces a BCI model. And the BCI model happens to also refer to the predictive mapping or prediction function. And um, these, these things here together are basically, um, uh, is basically two functions and some data structures, if you will, in practice. And uh, that's an important notion in, in this BCI lab toolbox as well. A paradigm is a con combination of these two functions and the respective behaviors, like take calibration recordings, produce this kind of model. So that takes us to the end of this module.